The Carolina Panthers finally added some help at edge rusher, but will it be enough? We'll talk about it right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, your team every day. That's our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe or follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter, at Julian Council, where on Fridays throughout the offseason, I'm right here answering your weekly Friday mailbag questions. The best way to get those questions into me is by either adding me or DMing me. But of course, follow me first on Twitter at Julian Council, and I'll answer your questions on next week's edition of the weekly Friday mailbag right here on Locked on Panthers. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started today. Now, I'm going to get to your weekly Friday mailbag questions here momentarily, but we do have some news here on a Friday afternoon, and I wanted to wait until Friday to record with y'all. Typically, I'll record on Thursday evenings and get the show out to you by Friday morning. But I decided with free agency going on, not too much news that happened on Thursday, just to wait until Friday to record. I had already recorded almost a full show, and then the Carolina Panthers had some new news. So this is me pretty fresh off of the breaking news from this afternoon for the Carolina Panthers. So can I answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions in the second and third segments of the show? But right now, let's talk about the Carolina Panthers adding some edge rusher help. Once the Panthers traded a Brian Burns on Monday night for a second round pick, fifth round pick swaps and a future fifth rounder in next year's draft, it became a massive priority for the Carolina Panthers. It's not like edge rusher already wasn't a need for the Panthers even before They traded away Burns. If they were going to keep him, they still needed to find someone opposite of Brian Burns who could provide something. Since they let Hassan Reddick walk in free agency two years ago, which was a move that they made because they were going after Deshaun Watson, the Panthers have not found a suitable replacement. And that's not necessarily a surprise. You don't just snap your fingers and immediately have another caliber player like Hassan Reddick there at the other edge rusher spot, then have Brian Burns also on your rusher, on your roster. Instead, They want Marquis Haynes, who went sackless for the first 10 games of that season until closing out that Falcons game on Thursday night football. Then this past season, unfortunately, his season never got off the ground because of a back injury that he basically showed up to camp with. And that was unfortunate for him. The Panthers went out and signed Justin Houston, who gave him a grand total of a half a sack this past season. DJ Johnson, who they traded up for the third round, he did not provide anything for them. Zero sacks during his rookie season. He's now 25 years old. So the Panthers have not been able to find a replacement for Hassan Reddick. So letting go of Burns made this a massive need for the Carolina Panthers, a major hole on the roster, especially when you look at they filled the guard spots. They went out there and traded for Deontay Johnson in the Dante Jackson trade with Pittsburgh. They needed to find edge rusher help. And they did that on Thursday afternoon. Three guys are looking at really on Wednesday and Thursday. Jadavion Clowney, Chase Young, DJ Woonham. They brought DJ Woonham to Carolina. He did not leave the building of outsigning a new contract. The former Vikings edge rusher signed a two-year, $12.5 million deal last year in Minnesota. One of them made 14 starts in 15 games, eight sacks, 62 tackles, seven tackles for loss through four seasons with the Vikings, a fourth round pick out of South Carolina. One of them is he had 23 career sacks, eight sacks last year, two years ago, also had eight sacks. So you've seen that's been the high bar for him. Can he potentially be a double digit sack guy in Carolina in the future? That certainly is the hope looking at pro football focus last year. His overall PFF grade was a 62.3. That was 74th out of 112 qualifying edge rushers. His run defense grade was a 68.6. That was 37th out of 112 qualifying edge rushers. And his pass rush grade, the one that we're most focused on, was a 56.8. That was 86th out of 104 qualifying players. Now, that does not necessarily 
match up with the eight sacks that he had last year. So he was 86 pass rush grade, but he had eight sacks. And looking at PFF, they credited him with 38 total pressure, six hits, and 23 quarterback hurries. They also gave him nine sacks and not eight sacks. Now you look at Pro Football Reference, you look at NFL.com, ESPN.com, they all have one of them at eight sacks. So it's really eight sacks. I don't know where PFF gave him the nine sacks from last year. Either way, he was an eight sack guy last year. He got home, provided some pressure, and he's 26 years old, going to be 27 come October. He's a Halloween baby, by the way. To me, this is a quality signing for the Carolina Panthers. It's not a lot of money. Two years, $12.5 million. They can get out of it probably after one season. Most of that money, I haven't seen the contract details pop up on overthecap.com just yet, but I'm imagining that most of the money is up front. And if he does not give the Panthers like eight sacks, what they're hoping for probably this season, if he's not a good enough guy creating pressure or gets injured, they can decide then, all right, we're not going to do a second season of this. But he's only going to be 27 years old. And he's a player who I think the Panthers potentially are bringing in thinking that, okay, if he has had eight sacks last season, he had eight sacks two years prior to that, maybe he gets that double-digit sack total. And maybe he's going to be somebody that we, the Panthers thinking themselves, can build around in this new look defense without Brian Burns at the edge rusher spot and still allow guys like DJ Johnson, who the Panthers went up and drafted last year and who Jero Vera really was a big fan of, allow him to develop and then come into a role down the line. DJ Wonham can be some of the Panthers have on the roster for the next three to four seasons. And that's a positive, especially when you're looking at a player under the age of 30. He's coming out of his rookie deal and now he's getting his first real contract in the NFL outside of the rookie deal. And it's for two years, $12.5 million. And if he plays well, you sign him to another deal and you keep him around until he gets up to 30, 31. That's a positive in my mind for the Carolina Panthers. This is also a guy who probably didn't have the greatest market looking around as most of the money has already been spent. Yes, he's been a productive player, but has he been a Pro Bowl player? No. Has he been an All-Pro? No. Is he ever going to be that? I'm not quite so sure the NFL values him that way. And looking at his draft slot, no, but he's also kind of lived up to the draft hype so far, being a former fourth round pick who's gotten to eight sacks so far two times in his career. Good signing for the Carolina Panthers. And he's probably somebody who looked at the market and realized, let me go out there and get what money I can. Because when you're starting to make visits, you're just hoping to get whatever you can from that team. You don't really have a big time premium market. If you did, you wouldn't be on the board come Thursday and Friday of the first week of free agency, where really all the big deals were announced on Monday and then some more on Tuesday and less so on Wednesday. Now it's the bargain part of free agency period for the NFL. So good deal for DJ Wunham. Now, once he signed, there were conversations of, okay, Chase Young, former number two overall pick out of Ohio State, former defensive rookie of the year, was a pro bowler, had the ACL tear. There were some questions about his want to, his commitment there in Washington, whether he could take care of his body. Then went to San Francisco with the 49ers, had a solid Super Bowl. He's back out on the market. No one's given him a big deal so far. He's going out and taking visits. He visited on Wednesday. He's going to visit the Saints. He's going to visit the Titans as well. Would this preclude the Panthers from signing Chase Young? Jadavion Clowney also visited the Carolina Panthers on Thursday evening. Reports from Aaron Wilson, who used to cover the Texans for the Chronicle, were saying that Kalani was going to be patient, was going to look around, take his time, and understand this. This is a player who last year did not sign with a team until free agency, not sorry, until training camp began. Different circumstances. Last year, coming off a two-sack season. This year, coming off a nine-and-a-half sack season, just turned 31. I'm thinking he's probably trying to capitalize on that nine-and-a-half sack season, but there's still teams out there who understand that he's gone from Houston to Cleveland. He's been in Seattle. He's been in Baltimore. He's been in Tennessee. He's about to be on a sixth team. He's been a journeyman. Not something I think a lot of the people expected when he was drafted number one overall out of South Carolina. How much money would he really be able to get? So for both of those guys... I was wondering, especially with Clowney almost getting double-digit sacks, would he be in the price frame for the Carolina Panthers after they signed DJ Wunham? Well, we now have the answer there as Clowney, he's headed up to New York to visit with the Jets on Tuesday, and we got Chase Young visiting with some other teams, maybe going to land a division rival in New Orleans. The Panthers decided on Friday afternoon that they were going to add another pass rusher, former first-round pick uh, from the Jags, Edge rusher Caleb on chase on out of LSU. They signed him to a one year, $5 million max deal. So that right there, once that news came out, 
pretty much ended any conversation, at least it should, in any conversation of whether Chase Young or Jadavion Clowney are coming to Carolina. Now, the Clowney part of it all, not particularly upset about it. Again, he's 31 years old. This is a team that is in a rebuilding stage. If they brought in Clowney, he was only going to be really a one-year solution. This is not a player like Wunham who, if he produces that eight-sack total this year and even again next season, he's someone you're going to keep around for the next three, four, five years in Carolina, really four or five years in Carolina. That's what you can build with on this defense as you also add more talent at that edge rusher spot. Clowney is going to be a one-year solution, and then you move on. Like, that's what it's going to be. And now Chase on on a one-year deal could be the same thing. This buys DJ Johnson more opportunity to kind of just develop. And then maybe by next year, if you can see some of the stay, steps this, forward this year, he can be that starter opposite of Wunham and you still continue to bring in some talent there at the edge rusher spot. But Clowney, he's an aging player. The Panthers don't need to bring in aging players that are already over the age of 30 into a spot where they are rebuilding. I did not view him as a player who is going to be the difference between the Panthers making the playoffs and missing the playoffs. I don't think they're going to be a playoff team this year anyways. The talent is just not there on the roster with or without Jadavion Clowney, so it does not bother me. Now, I would have liked to have Chase Young, though. I do question a few things about Chase Young, about really his commitment and his health status and whether he can be the player he was pre-ACL. And if he can actually fulfill the hype coming out of Ohio State, which he did the first two years, but has not done as much the last couple of seasons, which led the commanders to trade him away. And they also traded away Montez Sweat. They didn't want to invest in him long term. And so far, no team as of right now on Friday, March 15th, has signed him to a deal. So would have liked to have seen it happen. Now, for me, Chase Young's the kind of guy who would have come in here, probably sign a similar deal with Chase on maybe more, maybe like $8 million. And is that something the Panthers could have afforded after signing one of them to that two-year deal? Maybe, maybe not. I have to understand over the cap saying they have $16 million. That's not factoring in the one deal. That's also not factoring in the Josie Jewell deal. And they also have a rookie class they have to bring in. So they only have so much money they can really spend. Oh, yeah. And by the way, they still need a safety. Tight end, don't think that's going to happen right now. But they still need a starting safety after letting Von Bell go. Now he's re-signed in Cincinnati. So I don't know if Chase Young um, was going to be able to be something the Panthers could afford after one of them. But now looking at the Caleb on Jason deal, I don't think Chase Young is going to be cool signing for a $5 million max deal. Like, Jason's going to have to hit on incentives to get that max. And for Clowney and for Young, I'm betting both of their deals are going to be incentive-laden deals where, okay, this is a player who has a pedigree, as a former top two pick. If he hits on his totals, we want our money. I feel like that's going to be the case wherever they sign later on here in the NFL. So I would have loved to have Chase Young. But I think that if he would have played well, he's out on the market next year. And the Panthers could have franchised him, of course, but they also got to some, take some care of some deals as far as with Derek Brown and some other players before they could realistically do that. He may have been out in the market next year and you may not have been able to afford him and you're back in the market looking for another edge rusher, which could still be the case with Caleb on chase on who has not been a good player, to be honest with y'all in the NFL. Liked him at LSU. He is not fulfilled any of that first round promise he has played 57 games he's made 11 starts he has five career sacks five that's it for a guy who's drafted 20th overall two sacks last year which is a career high 13 tackles four tackles for loss in 2023 so the positive glass half full aspect of it is he's an ascending player in a way five career sacks only had three going into last year had two so nearly doubled his total that's the positive way to look at it uh, last year at 14 total pressures, six hits, six hurries. That was in 154 pass rush snaps, according to Pro Football Focus. Looking at his overall PFF grade, it's not great. It was a 54.7. His run defense grade was a 58.0. His pass rush grade was a 58.2. Not ideal at all for Caleb on Chase on. But here's the thing. The guy he worked with his rookie year was Todd Wash. Wash then left to go to Detroit. Now he's come to Carolina. And he's still here under a Jero Vero. Wash, I have to imagine, had to have some semblance of a say in, hey, that's a guy out of LSU that I like. Now he's coming in here. Now, I think it's really going to be Tim Lukabu, excuse me, who's going to be working with him. But I'm sure Todd Wash is going to get to work with him at some certain points of time throughout offseason period and during camp and during 
practice throughout the week during the season to try to work with Caleb on chase on. I'm thinking that Todd Wash probably was someone who also said to the Panthers, Hey, let's go out there, get that guy. And that's something I want to work with again. He's also a young player currently 24, going to be 25 in July. That's two young players. The Carolina Panthers are bringing in who are coming off of their rookie deals. And they're both from the same draft class, by the way, chase on just happens to be two years younger than DJ one is. He's a player where if he performs, the Panthers can bring him back and keep him for the next four, five years. This could be your potential edge rusher tandem, but you need to continue to bring in some talent. So this is not going to be the most celebrated signing, I would think, by Panther fans. There is the first-round pedigree. There is the upside there. The Panthers have really done a great job of buying low on some players and then the potential upside. They did that with Deontay Johnson. They've done that with Dane Jackson. They've done that with DJ Wonham. They've done that now with Caleb on chase on. Really smart by Dan Morgan and Brant Tillis to not spend a ton of money on some of these players that have shown that they can produce like Dane Jackson, like DJ Wonham, but also players that have the pedigree like a Caleb on chase on that. Maybe this can be a situation where in a year's time, you're looking at it like, man, that was a steal. Like Hassan Reddick was a couple years ago. That was a steal. Give him the right system, right scheme. And they really take off. Reddick did not take off till got the Carolina in the right system, right scheme. Carol Cardinals didn't use him properly. Maybe that's the problem in Jacksonville. Now, we did see Josh Allen have a great year. We saw Trayvon Walker. He's played well for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Not 100% sure why Chase on has not taken off so far, but now he's here in Carolina. Cheap signing, $5 million max. It's not clowny, which is not a big deal to me. It's not young, which is a little bit disappointing, but this is the right move for the Carolina Panthers. Get young players, coach them up, and see what you can do in the future as you're bringing more talent. So there we are as the Carolina Panthers have added two new edge rushers, DJ Wonham from the Vikings and Caleb on chase on from the Jags. All right, let me take a quick pause here. Then I'll come back and I'll answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions right here on Locked On Panthers. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply and now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. A 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, let's answer some mailbag questions, huh? Uh, let's start off with Chip, who asked me, so Bradley Bozeman has been released. What do you believe are the Panthers' best options for the center position? Is it free agency, the draft, or could someone like Brady Christensen be an option at center? As we have all learned, and I talked to the Chip about this via DMs, the Panthers are going to ride with Austin Corbett as their starting center for the time being. The only time in the NFL that Austin Corbett has played center was during the 2021 offseason with the Rams where they tried him out there as a starting center and eventually kicked him out to right guard, and the Rams went on to win the Super Bowl. Not saying that's the reason they won the Super Bowl, but they decided on their Super Bowl roster the best thing for them was for Austin Corbett to play at right guard. Now, the best thing for the Panthers may be for Austin Corbett to play at center, but he does not have much experience at all doing that outside of wearing shorts and T-shirts in the middle of May in Los Angeles or wherever they work out there in the greater L.A. area. I'm very curious to see how this works out for the Panthers. I remember Matt Rule saying back in the day, I mean, a couple of years ago, that, Brad, that Brady Christensen could be a center down the line. He's going to play swing tackle. He's also going to be probably the first in line to step in and play at guard. If anything, God forbid that happens to Robert Hunt or Damian Lewis this upcoming season. The good thing is, you now have an experienced player who has started for you and has played solid level uh, effort there at the guard spots in the past or that 2022 season. I'm still someone who wants to see the Carolina Panthers draft someone at the center spot. They try to get a veteran via free agency. Lloyd Cushenberry, someone they wanted. That didn't work out. He's a Titans player. I don't know if they ever were in on Tyler Beattis, but he's followed Dan Quinn from Dallas to Washington. And that's where the Panthers are. They spent a lot of money in the center spot or on the guard spot, rather. And they are now kind of going budget 
with the center position. Now, Dane Brugler from The Athletic, he tweeted this out about a week ago, saying how many NFL starting centers will come for the 2024 draft class. If the over-under is four and a half, I'm taking the over. He's talking about Jackson Powers Johnson, Graham Barton, Zach Frazier, Cedric Von Prahn, Taylor Bottolini, Hunter Norzad, and Bo Limmer, a few more promising options also available on day three. Well, Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon, he's going to go in the first round, so he's not an option. Graham Barton out of Duke could be an option. He's played left tackle. His entire career at Duke, so he's going to have to learn how to play a center spot. I think that's a situation where you can draft him, maybe at 33 or 39, put him behind Corbett and let him learn, or maybe have him come in and compete. Zach Frazier as well out of West Virginia. Would love that. Van Praan out of Georgia. The Panthers have an opportunity this draft, it seems, to draft the center. And Dane Brewer said, awesome, in all caps, year to draft the center. I think they need to do that. I have not done it since 2007 with Ryan Khalil. We have seen since Khalil left Carolina, how difficult it has been to find a quality player at that center spot. Paradis really wasn't that. Neither was um, Pat Elfline, who's not even, not even the league right now. Bozeman was, but then he wasn't. I think the Panthers really need to go out there, find a true center, develop that player, bring him in via the draft. This is the time to do it. That's my top option, but right now the Panthers' option is to have Austin Corbett play at that center spot for the time being. All right, now over to Kyle, who asked, during free agency so far, what has been a great and a feeling for me? The great is securing up the guard spots, and my A is keeping the running back room the same before the draft. I agree with you. The great is definitely signing Robert Hunt. I know it's a lot of money, but solid player. Signing Damian Lewis as well. Both those guys, 330-plus. The Panthers have had, it feels like to me, some undersized guys there in the interior of the offensive line the last couple of years. They have not been great in pass protection. They have really been bad also when it comes to short yardage situations trying to run the football and getting those two guys who can both be road graders for you and can protect Bryce Young. That's key for the Carolina Panthers. Obviously, it was paramount to their offseason to try and help Bryce Young, and they went out there and on day one of free agency helped out Bryce Young. And think about this. Compare this to what happened three years ago when the first two moves of free agency, Scott Fitter went out there and signed Pat Flying and Cam Irving. Some of the first moves that they made in free agency this year were signing Robert Hunt to $100 million contract and Damian Lewis allocating $89 million guaranteed to your starting guard spots free agency. The Panthers are not messing around when it comes to protection in the interior for Bryce Young. They're not messing around when it comes to trying to run the football either. Something that Dave Canales said at the combine, he was going to be stubborn about wanting to run the football. So I think that's great. I think it's great. Also, they're able to get Deontay Johnson for a player in Dante Jackson, who they were going to cut and then only give up a six round pick, then get a seven round pick in return. That's excellent for them to be able to do that kind of move um the f for me would be the tight end like the running back spot the Panthers spent money on a running back last year and we saw how that worked out for them with Miles Sanders he's still here under contract you're not going to give another running back a lot of money I get that Saquon was available like Josh Jacobs were and that's different than what the market was last year where none of those running backs got paid a ton of money until I like Miles Sanders got the highest running back contract free agency last year and then eventually you saw Jonathan Taylor get paid a lot up in Indianapolis with the Colts. I did not think the Panthers going to bring in a running back. They still have Chuba. They have Miles Sanders on the contract for the time being. They brought back Raheem Blackshear on an exclusive rights free agents deal. Uh, maybe they draft somebody, but I don't think if you were expecting them to do anything at running back, that's kind of that's on you because that was never going to be a priority for the Carolina Panthers. Tight end, though, they were three logical options that all had connections to this current staff, especially Pat McPherson, the tight ends coach, and Will Disley, um, Colby Parkinson, and Noah Fant, and they all went elsewhere. Fant staying in Seattle, Parkinson's headed down to L.A. with the Rams, and Disley's also heading down to L.A. with the Chargers. Not to get any of those three guys, that's disappointing. Ian Thomas, the survivor, he's still here. Tommy Trimble's still here. I'm not necessarily a believer in Tommy Trimble being like this high end, tight end, like prospect as far as like a guy who's going to come in and start to produce as a prime pass catcher. Do they necessarily need him to do that? No, but when he's open, can he catch the ball and make some plays for them? I think that's possible, but is he going to turn into like Greg Olson? No, and I'm not saying that's what people believe he's going to turn into. I just think that the Panthers still are very lacking with a proven pass catcher at that tight end spot. Like Hayden Hurst was supposed to be that last year. Outside of week one, he was not that. And even when Trimble came in, he had some moments. But if you look at the stats last year, it wasn't like his numbers were like super great. So 
We'll see how that works out. It is Tommy Trimble season right now, but I am disappointed that they weren't able to bring in the tight end. That's still going to be a position where the Panthers are going to have to probably go through the draft, try to find someone who actually was a pass catching tight end in college, develop them and see if that, that um, skill level can transition to the NFL. All right, let me take another quick pause on the show and I'll come back and answer the rest of your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on Locked On Panthers. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a number one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. At 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines, you can even pick who's going to win it all. And y'all, I've been using FanDuel all this week. Made some money, lost some money. Great time to get in on FanDuel. A ton of bonus bets out there, including... This one right there where you win your first $5 bet, you get 200 bucks in bonus bets, so please go out there and do it. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut the nets down. A couple more questions before we get out of here on this weekly Friday mailbag edition of Locked on Panthers. Got Brian now who says the Panthers have added Deontay Johnson, a very speedy, excellent route running wide receiver who can create separation. What qualities or wide receiver profile would you expect to believe the Panthers need to add to the offense, either through free agency or through the draft? Do we need another player with a similar skill set of Johnson or more of a big body possession wide receiver or some other type of receiver? Well, the Panthers certainly could add some more speed at the wide receiver position. They brought back Amir Smith Marset. We'll see how he's utilized, if he is utilized at all in this offense coming up this upcoming season. Last year was primarily a punt returner, did get an opportunity late in the season to be more of that gadget guy where they would just use him on jet sweeps. Can he be an all-around receiver? We'll see if that's what they want to do or they're going to continue to do that jet sweep stuff they did last year with him. We'll be interested to see what ISM can bring to the Carolina Panthers, especially as he does possess speed, just like Deontay Johnson, who – I don't know if it's necessarily speed, but he does possess the ability to get open. The Panthers, what qualities should be looking at a next wide receiver is a receiver who can run routes and can get open because they did not have players last year that were great route runners outside of Adam Thielen that could get consistently open, and Johnson provides that to Carolina. Now, looking at the profile the guys have right now, like Thielen going to be in the slot is – a smaller guy who's getting older, of course, he'll be 34 this year. Johnson, he's going to play on the outside, but he's still 5'10". He's a smaller guy as far as like an outside receiver. And currently you have Mingo 6'2", 215 at the other wide receiver spot playing the Z. I just don't think Mingo's ready. So for the Panthers, getting someone with some size, a 6'2", 6'3", receiver who can also separate and can run routes, that's what I'm looking for in a wide receiver right now. I would love to have T. Higgins still. I don't know if that's what the Panthers want to do, whether they can fit that in the salary cap at this point in time. It seems like they moved on to some other things. I also think the Bengals aren't really trying to t- trade T. Higgins anyways. Um, we'll see how all that plays out up in Cincinnati. I would think that that's probably not a conversation they're really going to have until the draft. And we'll see what decisions they make up in Cincy night one that could maybe lead them to trade T Higgins, uh, whether it be night one or on night two of the NFL draft. But for me, I think they just need to find somebody who's got a big body that can be kind of that guy you want to have as a red zone threat can be more of a possession receiver, but also someone who can separate. Like you want to have an all around receiver moving forward, but you need some size because you don't really have a ton of size as far as like guys who are experienced playmakers or just proven playmakers right now now if you get a guy in a draft wouldn't be a proven playmaker but you do need some size there at that receiver spot i think keon coleman has that size i look at ad mitchell has that size those are guys i like of course they're at 33 coming up next month final question comes from brad who says do you think there is any real benefit to robert hunt and damian lewis both having played with shorter quarterbacks also as much as losing Burns and Louvu sucks, is it possible the lesser known players the Panthers are bringing in could seem better just from a scheme fit perspective? I don't really see why it would matter for Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis what the size of their quarterback is. Their job is to protect, their job is to block. Like they're not really, I think, concerned about whether Tua is standing behind there or if they have like a Josh Allen standing behind them or now, of course, a Bryce Young. I don't think that matters to them. Uh, maybe it's a plus. I just thinking to myself, how would that matter at all? Uh, for those guys, I, I don't know. They're like they're big dudes, so I don't. I don't know. I don't think it really matters. Just go out there and do your job. As far as like losing Burns and Luvu, and then bringing in some players of familiarity. Excuse me. You have a guy like Josie Jewell who understands the scheme. 
that helps, of course. Um, then you have a guy like Ashawn Robinson on, who understands the scheme, of course. That helps. I do see those as positives more than I see it being a benefit that Hunt and Lewis have played in offenses with smaller like players because like Hunt played with Russell Wilson, then he had Geno Smith. I don't think his play has changed based off who the quarterback was behind him. His assignment was still the same. Go protect and also go push your man down the field when you ask to go do that as well. Um, but it is it is positive that the Panthers have targeted some guys that have connections to the staff, especially to Jerry Rivero, and that can understand his scheme. There's not going to be as much of a learning curve for them after moving on from players like Burns, like Luvu, also Dante Jackson, and of course Von Bell, who hadn't known the scheme but has now departed. So yeah, I think I can see where you're coming from from that perspective. The first one, I guess, not as much. That's going to wrap up this edition of the weekly. Sorry. Sorry, it's been a long week, guys. I've not been feeling great all week. But uh, that's going to wrap up this episode of the Lockdown Panthers podcast for the Lockdown Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, y'all, subscribe and follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me, Julian Council, on Twitter, at Julian Council. We'll be back with you next Friday, answer your weekly Friday mailbag questions. But in the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to y'all on Monday.